We are pleased that you have joined us this morning to participate in the symposium on the application of area-wide insect suppression to the Midwest landscape. This symposium is in honor of the 1992 World Food Prize laureates, Dr. Nippling and Dr. Bushland. To welcome you to this special symposium is the president of our university, President Martin Jiski. Dr. Jiski. It uh, certainly is a pleasure for me to welcome all of you to Iowa, to Ames, Iowa, and particularly to Iowa State University. Uh, on behalf of the whole university community, I would like to personally extend our congratulations to the 1992 World Food Prize recipients, Dr. Edward Nippling and Dr. Raymond Bushland. We are genuinely honored to have you here with us uh, today. Iowa State University is also honored to play a role in the administration of this World Food Prize and to join with the World Food Prize Foundation in sponsoring this symposium today. Iowa is a particularly fitting place for the World Food Prize. This prize recognizes individuals who have made significant and measurable contributions to improving the world's food supply. Iowa is one of the leading agricultural areas of the whole world and it is a state that is committed to improving food production throughout the world. All of us at Iowa State are also indebted to John Ruan for his efforts in bringing this prize to Iowa. Uh, with the continued support of John and his staff, the university, the people of Iowa, we believe the World Food Prize will continue to grow in stature and gain the recognition that its recipients so richly deserve. The topic of today's symposium fits very nicely with Iowa State. Our entomology program has a long and rich history. It was first taught here as part of zoology as far back as 1872, 120 years ago. The entomology program has produced many gifted scientists, including two who will speak here today, Dr. Nippling, the 1992 World Food Prize laureate, and Dr. Donald Lenquist, who is today's keynote speaker. Both of these people received master's degrees and doctoral degrees in entomology at Iowa State. Iowa State University is committed to developing new methods of suppressing insects while preserving the environment. The Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, which is located here at Iowa State, is at the forefront of this effort. The Leopold Center operates the largest state-funded competitive grants program in sustainable agriculture. Since it was created in 19... Uh, 87, uh, the center has awarded thousands of dollars in grants to projects seeking biological ways to control insects. And many of these projects involve interdisciplinary teams that are taking what we believe are very innovative approaches to pest control. Now, I would be remiss as president of Iowa State if I didn't mention a rather novel approach to insect suppression that two of our entomology students have taken on in recent weeks. Kathy Gee and Julia Stevens appeared on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno to promote insects as pets and snack foods. <laughs> Who knows if maggot crispies and chocolate chirpies will catch on. If so, perhaps we could redirect entomology into the food production part of our egg curriculum. More seriously, the work of entomologists such as Dr. Nippling and Dr. Bushland is making it possible for people to produce more and better quality food throughout the world. And as we all know, this is truly the path to world peace. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much, President Jiski. President Jiski is a real champion of the land grant system and we're pleased that he's our president uh, at Iowa State University. It's an honor to introduce John Ruan as our next speaker to give you a welcome from the Council of the World Food Prize. Through John's single efforts, the World Food Prize has been brought to Iowa. 
And under his leadership, he has given it a foundation from which it can grow. John, we're pleased that you're with us this morning, and we're looking forward to your welcome comments. Thank you, and good morning. As chairman of the World Food Prize Foundation, I'm pleased to welcome you to this World Food Prize Symposium in which we are co-hosting with Iowa State University. I'm honored to be here among so many bright people. Perhaps some of you were with us in Des Moines yesterday as we awarded the World Food Prize for 1992 to Dr. Edward F. Nippling and Dr. Raymond C. Bushel. I'm happy to say you'll have the opportunity to become better acquainted with these two eminent scientists during this morning's symposium. During our award ceremony yesterday, we presented a short video entitled by their fruits, the world shall know them. The video is our best way of telling the story of the World Food Prize and what it represents. I'd like to show you that video now. And will we have the lights, please? take food for granted, but take it away even briefly, and people experience devastating hunger. Take it away for a protracted length of time, and they die. People in affluent nations often think of hunger as a distant, incomprehensible concept, but it isn't. Tragically, hunger and malnutrition most often affect the unborn, small children, and their mothers. Civilization cannot survive, let alone thrive, without a stable, nutritious food supply. One capable of producing not only enough food for the present world population of 5.3 billion people, but enough to meet the needs of a population that is growing by 95 million people annually, 260,000 daily, almost 11,000 hourly. Until 1986, there was no major prize for those who improved the quality, quantity, and availability of food in the world. No global recognition to inspire and challenge gifted, creative, and dedicated people to pursue careers in the complex field of food. But that has changed, thanks to the vision and accomplishments of one man, Dr. Norman E. Borlaug, eminent international scientist and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 for fathering the Green Revolution. There was no price available in the Nobel Foundation for food or agriculture. And so they put me through the window for peace, the only uh, window through which I could pass. And now we have such a price, so that on its own merit, food across all of the links in the chain can be recognized. Dr. Borlaug dreamed of an award comparable to the Nobel Prizes, an award to honor people who address the alleviation of hunger and malnutrition. Beyond recognizing these people for their professional accomplishments, he saw the prize as a means of establishing role models who would inspire others. In 1986, Borlaug's dream was realized with the creation of the World Food Prize. The World Food Prize, now headquartered in Des Moines, Iowa, in the heartland of American agriculture, recognizes achievements in every field affecting the world's food chain. The award is made without regard to race, color, religion, national origin, age, sex, or political beliefs. The College of Agriculture at Iowa State University in Ames, Iowa, serves as secretariat for the World Food Prize. Nominations are solicited for more than 3,500 institutions and organizations around the world. An anonymous selection committee reviews the nominations and selects the recipient. Awarding $200,000 to its laureate, the World Food Prize ranks among the world's preeminent honors. 1992 marks the sixth awarding of the World Food Prize. The first World Food Prize, awarded in 1987, went to M.S. Swaminathan of India. Dr. Swaminathan was honored for introducing the high-yielding miracle grains of wheat and rice to India's farmers. Robert F. Chandler, Jr. won in 1988 for establishing and being the first director of the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. Dr. Chandler is credited with tripling rice production around the world and averting famine in Asia in the 1970s. In 1989, Verghese Curium was chosen for revolutionizing milk production in India 
and teaching farmers to set up efficient distribution channels. His Operation Flood turned the smallest villages into cooperatives that produce, process, and market milk throughout India. The 1990 laureate John S. Niederhauser was honored for his innovative leadership in advancing the research, production, and global consumption of the potato. Dr. Niederhauser discovered and utilized a durable resistance to the potato late light disease. In Mexico, potato production increased sixfold as a direct result of Dr. Niederhauser's role in developing a strong national program involving both scientists and farmers. In 1991, the World Food Prize was awarded to international nutritionist Nevin S. Scrimshaw. Dr. Scrimshaw was founding director of the Institute of Nutrition of Central America and Panama, INCAP, where he developed the principle for a low-cost, protein-rich food product to fight the deadly protein deficiency disease that attacks children in their weaning years. While at INCAP, Dr. Scrimshaw also developed a successful method of iodizing the moist local salt to prevent another serious disease, endemic goiter, a swelling of the thyroid gland due to iodine deficiency. This advancement in nutrition has alleviated endemic goiter in many countries of the world. And now for 1992, the World Food Prize is awarded to a team of entomologists who have given the world an environmentally friendly means of eradicating specific insects that threaten the food supply. Dr. Edward F. Nibbling and Dr. Raymond C. Bushland of the United States developed the Sterile Insect Technique, or SIT, used in the United States, Mexico, Central America, and Africa to control the screw worm, a destructive pest that attacks warm-blooded animals. SIT has also been used in many areas of the world to successfully control a variety of insects that damage fruits and vegetables. With SIT, no chemicals are used, no residues are left behind, and there are no effects on non-targeted species. As a result of Nibbling and Bushland's innovative efforts, the advancement and application of biological pest controls will have a profound impact on preserving a safe, stable food supply for the world. The search for solutions to world hunger continues, as it must, if we're to reach the goal of an adequate, sustainable food supply for all people. Our most recent laureates agree. We have to move forward. We have to uh, improve our technology. We have to be more efficient. Unless we uh, continue to improve our technology, our efficiency, uh, we won't be able to feed the people. We're just at the very beginning of this thing. In the years ahead, the World Food Prize will continue to honor the men and women whose life's work is dedicated to improving the quality, quantity, or availability of food for our ever-growing global population. That's the pledge of businessman and philanthropist John Ruan, chairman of the World Food Prize Foundation, established to provide ongoing sponsorship for the prize. I pledge my own energies and resources to these real-life heroes whose work not only touches the soil, but also touches the hearts of all mankind. By assuming sponsorship of the World Food Prize, we can create almost an appropriate nurturing environment for it right here in what's often called the nation's breadbasket. Much has been done to strengthen people's fundamental food supply, to fight hunger that's obvious as well as hidden hunger caused by poor nutrition. Because of the World Food Prize laureates and many others whose ideas and dedication remain as yet unheralded, we are on many fronts better off than 50 years ago. But much remains to be accomplished. It is people, individuals, who will make the difference. The World Food Prize honors those who have and inspires others who will. And by their fruits, the world shall know them. see from this video, the World Food Prize is now an established program, one that will continue to develop and grow in the stature as the importance of food and agriculture becomes even more universally recognized. We Iowans understand the key role food and agriculture play in supporting all human activity. American agriculture has led the world in this regard, but today the emphasis on 
is on world agriculture. As food producers, food distributors, scientists, governments, and other organizations around the globe work to combat hunger and malnutrition, the World Food Prize will continue to be spotlight, <coughs> continue to spotlight and honor those efforts in the years ahead. Again, thank you for joining us today. We hope you find these <coughs> sessions informative and useful. Thank you so much, John, for your dedication and enthusiasm for the food industry and its future. I think that with Jiski and local here and Iowa State University, we're on the verge of something really great. It's so it's so enormous. Uh, I can help, but takes the smart people to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Terry. The World Food Prize has a truly outstanding council. And we're honored to have several of the council members with us this morning to participate in this symposium. I'd like to introduce the council members that are here today and have them stand to be recognized. Robert McNamara. Mr. McNamara. <laughs> Mr. McNamara has championed many, many responsible positions in Washington, now retired as past president of the World Bank. And we're really pleased to have you as part of the council. Pekka Winko. Pekka, uh, over here. Pekka is a professor uh, at the Helsinki Technical University and is one of the early council members and has made great contributions uh, to the foundation of the World Food Prize Award. And we're pleased that you are with us this morning. Bob Hadner. Bob, if you'd stand, President of Winrock International. I think Bob's wife Liz is here. Are you here? Is that right there? Uh, please stand and be recognized too. Winrock International was the first secretariat for the World Food Prize and played a very important role in the foundation uh, of this uh, uh, prize. And we thank you, Bob, for your contributions. Uh, Dr. Gordon Eaton. Gordon, if you'd stand. Not here. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Eaton was with us yesterday, uh, former president of Iowa State University, and has been very instrumental also as a uh, board member and a council member. Al Clossy. Al, if you'd stand. His wife Janet is here someplace. Well, Janet, yeah. over here. <laughs> Alice, to be credited with uh, obtaining the original funds for the World Food Prize when he was senior vice president of General Food Corporation. Al is now retired. Uh, but when he retired from General Foods, he took on the responsibilities of leadership in the uh, IFT, Institute of Food Technologists. He's president-elect of that uh, very prominent uh, scientific organization for the food industry. And Al, we thank you so much for your contributions. The last member of the council that is here today is Norman Borlaug, Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And it was Norman's idea to establish the World Food Prize. I'd like to ask Norman to come up and, and share with you in the next few minutes the concept that he had in establishing the World Food Prize. Norman? Dean Topol, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 
I won't go into the details, but I think uh, the video gave us some idea of how this came about. Simply let me add that uh, when I did receive the uh, Nobel Prize, even though it was for work in agriculture uh, and food, uh, I, re I, of course, went through the window of uh, peace because there was no prize for agriculture. Probably had Alfred Nobel written his will in 1850 or thereabouts rather than 1945. It might have been different shortly after the potato famine of Ireland because it wasn't just the potato famine of that time. Uh, population by and large had outgrown uh, Euro Western Europeans ability to produce the food that was needed. And of course, the late bright fungus brought it all to the fore with the epidemic and the tragic losses of the potato crop on which so many people depended. I suspect if I could prove it, if I went back to the uh, little patch of land of my forefathers at the bottom of Southern Fjord in Norway, I would uh, come to the conclusion that they too were driven out uh, with the failure of the potatoes because the piece of land was probably as big as this auditorium or at most another 50% larger right at the bottom of the fjord. And uh, when the potatoes went out, I suspected that uh, fish alone wasn't quite acceptable and so they migrate. And I'm sure in this audience there are many of your great-grandparents and grandparents who followed the, the same patterns. But by uh, the middle of the 50s, there had been a big change in Europe. If you look back in history, you will see that it was then that Leeding began his work on fertilizers, especially on phosphates, to restore soil fertility. And in Britain, Laws and Gilbert, and Bossingall in France, uh, on, uh, working on nitrogen. And not too, about that same time, uh, Duberry, the father of plant pathology, was uh, beginning his work. And of course, Pasteur. Uh, there was a great awakening a little later, uh, Mendel. And by 1995, when Alfred Nobel wrote his will, uh, the crisis wasn't there to the same extent would have been 50 years before, not just because their agriculture had become more productive, but especially because of the escape valve. Uh, many people had migrated to the Americas. And in addition, their industrialization was then well tuned for export or earning hard currency with which to buy surplus grains from the America. And so this explains I think that in large part why there no, was no price for food or agriculture when the Nobel Foundation was, uh, uh, prices were established. When I received the price through the window of peace, of course I realized it would probably be a long time before the crisis situation uh, would have uh, been such as it was in the middle 60s when my Mexican colleagues and various Indian Pakistani colleagues were instrumental in transplanting the technology on wheat production that we developed in Mexico into those two countries and later into several others to produce a rather dramatic change in production. I realized that it would probably be a long time before there would be another series of events which would permit someone in agriculture or food to be a recipient for such a prize. So I began to push and write letters and, uh, to the Nobel Foundation and eventually uh, about the 19, uh, I've forgotten the exact time, but more or less in 1983, uh, I was invited to present my case to the Board of trustees of the Nobel Foundation in Stockholm. 
and I had done my homework well because I knew that they were adverse to uh, adding new prices. But I did know that the price for economics had been added, and I also knew that the funds came from the Bank of Sweden rather than the Nobel Foundation uh, funds. And so I proceeded to find out whether there might be other sources of funding to establish the price with the blessing of the foundation, as was done for economics, and uh, contacted uh, academies of agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, as I should say, agriculture, fisheries, and forestries in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and by the letter with Finland. And they said, if you can convince the Nobel Foundation to establish the price, we will raise the funds if you also participate. And so I presented the case in that way. And of course, they said that uh, they could not establish a price. And I reminded them about the economic price. But of course, these were funds from elsewhere. So I said, then there should be no problem. But immediately, the chairman threw up his arms and he said, never again will we open the door uh, uh, to establish more prices because it will probably dilute the value of the price. So we struggled around for a number of years. And thanks to Al Clossy, uh, who was then a senior vice president of General Foods, uh, the price came into being. And in that early group of uh, counselors and advisors was Bob Hayden, Pecklinko, and uh, where's my fourth one? Oh. Ah, okay. Uh, so that's the way the price was established. I don't want to bore you with details, but we went through a rather hectic period. And uh, then finally, the price found its home here under the John Ruan Foundation. And I've seen, had the pleasure of seeing it grow. Uh, and the quality, I think, of the people who have received the prize is above uh, reproach. And not only that, there are people of eminence in their field, and it's across quite a few already of the links in the food chain from production until the food is on your plate. And I hope and pray that this price will grow in prestige because if we are going to stay ahead of what I call the population monster, this increment of human population, one billion more every decade, it's a big job. And we need the best young talent of girls and boys uh, to see a challenge in this field, in food, from the whole breadth of the food chain. Thank you very much. Wonderful words from the father of the Green Revolution. We thank you so much. We're also honored today to have the 1990 laureate with us, uh, John Niederhauser. And uh, I visited with John last evening at the reception and asked if he would just say a few words as, as a past recipient of this uh, wonderful award, World Food Prize. John? members of the World Food Prize Council, friends and colleagues. I must say it's a very wonderful pleasure to be able to join you here today, as well as at the fine recognition ceremony yesterday for the recipients of the World Food Prize for 1992. As we discussed yesterday, the world is entering one of the most critical periods in the history of mankind. We had some inspiring words at the end of this wonderful ceremony yesterday given by Mr. McNamara in which he asked a few questions. One of them was, do we have the knowledge to proceed 
through this decade and into the next millennium and feed the population of the world throughout the next century? His answer was, and I think quite correct, that we do not today have that technology. However, in a subsequent conversation, I also wanted to say with him and to express this feeling to you that we do have a great deal of technology which is available and to accomplish some of the goals for which the World Food Prize was created and also the goals that are confronting all of us who are interested in feeding the world in this critical coming century. As has been said many times, the food, the food necessary for this growing population, which probably will hopefully stabilize at approximately 12 billion in the year 2100, we do have the soil, the water, and the climate to feed this population. The limiting factor is going to be if we have the discipline and the dedication and the technology to take advantage of these resources and to feed this many people. We have today two laureates who are a wonderful example of the technology which is needed to be developed during this coming century a technology which will control some of the limiting factors without, say, additional automatic use of chemicals or chemical residues. In other words, preserving a productive, sustainable agriculture and preserving the quality of our environment. This is going to require all of the genius, all the technology, and all of the resources that we can muster. And as I said earlier, this is probably one of the greatest crises to confront mankind. I think we are together today in recognizing more and more of these problems. One of them, of course, is to take advantage of existing technologies and to adapt them to the needs of the world during this next decade and during the next millennium. Again, I want to point out that the example of what has been done by these two fine laureates that are being recognized here today is also an example of a technology, a very fine technology, which according to what we heard yesterday, lay dormant for several decades as far as world impact is concerned. We must stimulate the recognition of these technologies so that they're applied sooner. The transfer of technology is badly needed in many, many parts of the world. And as a final word of warning, when we speak about a world population stabilizing, hopefully, at say 12 billion, at that time, in the year 2100, 90% of that world population will be in what we call the developing countries of the world. That is the challenge confronting us today. Dr. Borlaug very wisely drew attention to the need for the involvement of the wonderful abilities and the inspiration and the youth of the scientists in our universities and associated with them today. I also want to use the words, they seem almost automatic, those of international cooperation. And I'm not referring to aid programs. I'm referring to international cooperation to solve some of these production problems which we have in the world in places where they have a comparative advantage to do so and to attack and these problems and provide solutions which are of mutual interest. If we learn how to do this, there is indeed a great hope and it really a grounds for optimism in the world. Again, I want to congratulate the creators of this World for Prize, to the two laureates we've recognizing during these two days of ceremonies here, and to Iowa State University, which happens to be a wonderful example of an institution which is taking the leadership in some of these strategies 
that are so badly needed in the conquest of hunger. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Dr. Nieder Hauser is one of our world famous plant pathologists and did his work on the potato. It was of interest that Dr. Barlog mentioned uh, the famine, the potato famine. Now we're going to uh, start our symposium, and we're honored to have as our keynote uh, speaker, Dr. Link Quest. Dr. Link Quest has spent the last 20 years working in the area of eradication of insect pests. He currently has responsibilities with a, pro a joint project of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency, a division of nuclear techniques in food and agriculture based in Vienna, Austria. He also directs FAO's field program for screw room eradication in North Africa. Dr. Lindquist was educated at Oregon State University and Iowa State University where he did his graduate studies. We're pleased to have Dr. Lindquist with us today to give the keynote address. Some years since I've been on the campus here, <clears throat> probably more than 25 if I'm not mistaken. It's an honor for me to be here. The World Food Prize is very late in coming. It should have been the first Nobel Prize. We depend more on food than what the other prizes are awarded for. FAO and IAEA, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, located in Rome. And the International Atomic Energy Agency, located in Vienna, Austria, decided a number of years ago to have a joint division. It's the only joint division in existence in the United Nations system. It deals with the peaceful uses of atomic energy in food and agriculture. It is a division in both FAO and IAEA. Our program of work and budget is approved by the Board of Governors and uh, members of both of these organizations. Now, the topic of the symposium, the uh, area-wide control in the Midwest landscape, I think is what the title of it was, and the topic assigned me, basically the sterile insect technique go together, of course, very, maybe I should use this thing. Very red, is this thing on? Sterile insect technique cannot be used on a field by field basis. <clears throat> the, generally, there are two basic approaches to insect control. One is the field by field approach, and one is an area wide approach. And I'll, before going into the sterile insect technique and a little bit on the Libyan screwworm program, I want to go over some of the differences between an area wide and a field-by-field uh, approach to insect control. There's one major difference. In field-by-field, field, you are protecting a plant, an animal, or an item. This is frequently done with insecticides. In an area-wide control, your target is the insect population pest population. Your target is not 
to protect an individual corn plant or a field of corn. Your target, what you think about, is the insect, the pest insect population. And if you think about this for a few minutes, you will realize that there are very huge differences in your whole concept of how you going, go about trying to manage whatever the pest may be. Now, we in Vienna work with the sterile insect technique, and therefore we don't even think in terms of field by field control. We can't, because the technology cannot be used for that. Let me give you a, a, a layman's difference between field by field and area wide. Now, it doesn't fit farming, but we're not trying to convince, in all cases, farmers or producers. We're trying to convince the general public that there are different approaches to insect control. So we have an apartment building with maybe 20 apartments in it. This apartment building has cockroaches. And then the field-by-field field approach, each individual occupant of an apartment treats his property, his apartment, with whatever control method he wants to use. It may be the one that he buys at the drugstore. It may be the one recommended on TV. But he does it, or she does it. If an individual apartment is treated, and the others are not, the cockroaches will move very rapidly back into the treated apartment. However, if this apartment, the owners in this apartment get together and say there should be a cheaper, more effective method of doing this, and they contract with a private pest control operator to do the total apartment building, including the garages, the garage, the all interior areas, with a control technology. It will be much less expensive. It will use much less insecticide if you're using insecticide. And it was going to be more effective for the simple reason that you're attacking the total population, not just the, the cockroaches in one individual apartment. Now, this is a naive type of example, I admit. It has nothing to do with farming. But you can say the same thing about cornfields, feedlots, uh, stored products. You can look at the whole, the whole range of things that entomology, entomologists try to protect. And you'll see the same thing. So <clears throat> to a certain extent, the target of area-wide control is the insect population and not the corn, not the uh, corn stalk. The approach in the general approach in the field by field is a catch up. To make area wide work, it has to be preventative, like preventative dental care, preventative medicine. And this has been one of the real failures I feel in entomology, not us using preventative medicine to manage insect populations. But it can only be done on an area-wide basis. It cannot be done on a field-by-field -field basis. Insects have a nasty habit of moving. They move from one field to the next field. Responsibility for the field-by-field, -field, of course, is the individual producer. In area-wide, it is not their direct responsibility. It can be cooperatives. It can be governments. And the methods, one is protection. You are protecting a commodity from insect attack. The other one is you're managing the insect population. And again, I remind you that these are differences which must be taken into consideration in future, in designing future insect technologies. Okay, with all that in mind, <clears throat> we'll move on to the sterile insect technique, which is the subject or the main reason that the two gentlemen, Drs. Nippling and Bushland, were awarded the World Food Prize. We uh, in Vienna are very, very happy about this because it recognizes the work that we've been doing over the last good many years 
to foster this type of technology on a number of insect pests. This technique was the brainchild of Dr. Nippling in the late 30s. He and some other people were working on the screw arm control and they weren't making much progress. In other words, there, <coughs> there was not much solution to the problem. It, it was there and they were studying it. However, Nip observed two or three things. First of all, he observed after Bush figured out how to, how to rear the things, in huge numbers, that these male, sterile male screw worms were very sexually active. This was in the laboratory in cages. He also observed that there were not many of these things in nature. And by putting two and two together, he and Bush dreamed up this idea that maybe if they released enough of them, reared and released enough of them in nature, and these ones that were released were sterile or something else was done to them, that they could be used, the laboratory reared and released ones could be used against the wild ones. Well, the Second World War came along and a few other things, but it did, the idea was there, and the idea kept growing, and after the war it, it blossomed. One of the keys was to find out how to sterilize the insects. This is where atomic energy came in. Uh, and once this was realized and Bush proved that it would work, there was no stopping these two people because they had the basic understanding of insect populations, the method of rearing, but most important, the will and the leadership ability to put the pieces together to do it. And that's basically why we're here. Now, I'm sure that all of you in this audience know understand the, the technical aspects of the sterile insect technique. And if you have a number, a, a, n enough numbers of sterile males in the field who will overwhelm the native ones, you will have most of the matings will be between the wild female and the sterile male. If you have 9 to 1 ratio, you'll have 90% sterility. If you have 19 to 1, you'll have 95% sterility, and so on. And you treat once, in other words, one generation, and you either stop the population from growing or reduce it a bit, use the same dosage of sterile insects the second generation, and you'll start the population down. All of you have, I'm sure, have seen the simple but very elegant population models that Dr. Nippling came up with to describe this. It's birth control of insects, pure and simple. It's population management. During the uh, last couple of years, there have been some major events utilizing this technology. Screwworm was eradicated from Mexico. The screwworm was eradicated from Libya. And the melon fly was eradicated from Okinawa and Japan, all utilizing this technology. Now, these were expensive programs, very expensive programs. The Japanese program cost about $100 million. The Libya program cost about $80 million. The Mexico, to eradicate the Mexico, the screw arm from Mexico was several hundred million. I don't have the exact figure. I doubt whether anybody does, but it's, it, these are expensive programs. However, if you look at the economics of these programs, and this is the important thing. <clears throat> the Estimate made by economists, these, these estimates are made by economists, not by entomologists. In Libya, was it based on the assumption that it would spread throughout North Africa, the benefit to cost ratio is 50 to 1. The new screw worm in Mexico is 
been estimated at 10 to 1, and of course increases for every year that there's no screw worm infestation. The melon fly program cost $100 million. The estimates made by the Okinawa Prefecture was that they would repay that $100 million in the first year, maybe two years at the most. In other words, the economics of these very, very large programs are enormous. They're very, very positive. So it, they are costly. They're difficult. But the payoff is very, very high. Now, the sterile insect technique is known as a, a method for eradication. Of course, it's not only used for that. It's used for a number of other, uh, in a number of other cases. It's used as a quarantine against the pink bollworm in the state of California and the Mexican fruit fly along the Texas-Mexican border. It's used in an integrated pest management program in the Netherlands, the only commercial use of, of the technology against the onion fly. It's of course been used successfully against the screw worm in the US, Mexico, and Libya, Mediterranean fruit fly from Mexico and some small infestations in California and Florida. The melon fly in, uh, in Okinawa. It's being considered for setsi fly in a number of African countries. It's planned to be used Factory is going up against the coddling moth in Western Canada. And that's an interesting story because when the work was first done about 12 years ago, it was considered too expensive, non-competitive with the use of insecticides. About three years ago, they went back and had an economic analysis made uh, of the, how to manage the coddling moth in Western Canada. And the, the answer was that, well, uh, the sterile insect technique was made the most sense economically. They didn't believe it. They had a second economic analysis made with the same result. They still didn't believe it. It took three economic analysis before the people involved would believe what the economists were telling them. So they decided, well, it must be true. So they have embarked on a program, not of eradication, but of control. So I think the concept that the technology that can only be used for eradication needs to be uh, clarified and understood a little bit more. Just so that you understand some of this, this the, uh, <clears throat> these are practical programs the screw worm, the pink bow worm, the old world screw worm is available for use in Australia. Med fly, Mediterranean fruit fly, onion fly, Mexican fruit fly. They're uh, planned programs, which I just mentioned, the screw worm, med fly. Other, other species of fruit flies, there's a whole series of fruit fly species which it can be used for coddling moth, old world screw worm, sets a fly, and so forth. Now, <clears throat> there have been some recent improvements in certain, in certain parts of the sterile insect technique. One of the things that uh, is of concern is the release of both sexes. A reasonable amount of information available that when you laboratory rear or rear in factories large numbers of these things and put them both out that the, the laboratory reared male and female prefer each other. Therefore, if you can eliminate the females somehow or the other through a genetic sexing system, the male that's released will be much more effective. This has been done with mosquitoes on an experimental basis. We have in, in Vienna have finally arrived at a, a method of, of uh, sexing Mediterranean fruit flies in the egg or neonate larval stage with a heat sensitive lethal, which uh, we've done enough work with it now to, see, to show that it will work quite well. It's, it's, a, it's a good insect. Quality control field tests have shown that it works. 
we hope that this will be picked up and used by others. The concept of free fly releases, in other words, instead of a container, also decreases cost and is being worked on. Now, the screw worm program has developed a very nice system. Others have been developed and are starting to be used. It, people are starting to understand that these relatively simple cost saving methods are very, very important in the program. If you're using one million cardboard boxes a, a year with, at a cost of a uh, dollar a box, and you can reduce that cost 50 cents a box, you save a good bit of money. It's this type of thing that is making continuous improvements in the uh, technology. Rearing systems are continuously being improved as people start to look on the manufacture, the rearing of insects as a manufacturing process. As quality control factors become uh, more understood. Now, I was <clears throat> fortunately or unfortunately involved with the, the screw arm eradication program in Libya, which I was, it was suggested that I, that I make a few comments about that. And I've got some slides that, if I can have the, The slide will get on. Will get on. The, the screw worm was discovered in Libya in about 19, 1988. When it got there, nobody knows. It could have been there three or four years before, but nobody knows. The uh, program generated a lot of of uh, concern, particularly in the Americas, where they knew the uh, the insect, what damage it would do not so much in Europe and virtually none in, in uh, North Africa. This was cured very quickly with a reasonably good public relations uh, <coughs> effort by the Food and Agricultural Organization. Of course, the livestock attack is somewhat different. The, uh, <coughs> there are a good number of camel in, uh, in Libya. They're used primarily for food, not for <coughs> transportation. What do you do when you go into a country like this and your objective is to eradicate the screw worm? It occurred in about a 25,000 square kilometer area, uh, fairly densely populated, a good number of, of livestock, a head of livestock, primarily sheep. In any eradication program, you have to have surveillance, quarantine, before you can do anything else. Surveillance tells you where it is, how many it is, quarantine stops the spread. This is one of the teams working on the surveillance activities in, uh, in Libya. The animals were individually inspected. Okay, this, uh, you can see up there the uh, small white The small white dot up, up in Libya, that's the infested area. The crosshatched area was the, is the area which was considered to be at risk, and the others, if not too much at risk. This is the map of Libya with the infested area and the dotted area there. Libya has a lot of desert, so there was not much danger of it moving south or for that matter to the east because it was dry and it was a long way to uh, Benghazi where the next uh, area of agriculture was. To the west was a very different story. Tunisia was right there and it had to be protected at all costs because working in one country is bad enough, working in two countries is, is very, very difficult. This is the surveillance area. Uh, with this, this is the area which was covered by the surveillance teams. We used a 5% Kumafos Ossental powder for individual animal treatment by the surveillance teams, by the farmers. 
This is a shot of the, most of the territory was looked somewhat like this. Again, the surveillance teams taking a look at some of the animals. We did some spraying. This was pretty well abandoned because they did not provide us the necessary information on infestation of, uh, of the animals. This is the quarantine stations which were set up and operational. Most of them ran day and night. Initially they only ran during the daytime, but when uh, <clears throat> we finally got enough people uh, involved in the program, it was increased to 24-hour operation. We will sign of the quarantine station. This is what the quarantine stations were. They are mobile, so we could move them in case the area of infestation changed. Most of the transport of the animals are in pickup trucks like this. Very uh, commonly, they are moved from the farm to the slaughterhouses. Public relations information was available to hand, hand out to the, uh, to the people who were transporting the animals. Now, this is a, a map of the cases January through June of, of last year when the program basically finished. We had the three cases, you can see nine, one, and then one in February, the two in February the 20th, and the, and the 16th of February, and one in, in April. <clears throat> the small area in the top left with angled lines is, was the preliminary release area. The rest of the area is where the releases were made after the middle of, or the first week in February. And we had a very cold, for, for Libya, cold winter. 1991, which reduced the population. We were fortunate enough to have the sterile flies waiting in the field by the middle of February over the entire, entire infested area for those individuals that came out of the ground. In other words, we had the sterile males waiting for the wild females, which is necessary if you're going to make this technology work. The transport was of some difficulty since we bought the flies from the factory in Mexico. The initial transport was by truck from Cuxley Gutierrez to Mexico City, by uh, regular scheduled flight from Mexico City to Frankfurt, Germany, and then charter flight from Frankfurt to Tripoli. After May of 1991, we had charter flights directly from Cuxley Gutierrez to Tripoli. The, uh, <clears throat> the difficulties in getting all of this organized and arranged, of course, were sizable. It required action by the U.S. Congress, signature by the President, and, and waivers, and this, that, the other thing. The Mexican government had to go through the same thing for these sterile flies to be used outside of the Americas. And of course, the political situation between <clears throat> most of the world and Libya was not very favorable. Fortunate, fortunately, though, the politics was set aside in this whole exercise. The, uh, <clears throat> the Libyan government supported this thing very, very well. I'm sure that many of you know this picture. It's a screwworm plant in Tuxla Gutierrez. You've seen the, this is the, uh, gel diet, which is used now. This is pupae, radiation source, more of it, radiation units, packaging. This is the German cargo plane that loaded the uh, 40 million flies, 40 million sterile pupae every week. The charter flight that went to, to Tripoli. Fourteen hours later, we were unloading them at the Tripoli International Airport. You also have to realize that this program was going on during the Gulf War, which was a little bit disconcerting. However, nothing happened. We were probably safer there than you people here were in, in Ames. 
these uh, boxes were um, packaged, of course, in baskets on standard aircraft pallets so they could be handled. They were put in uh, refrigerated trailers, temperature controlled trailers, again, mobile in case we had to move the units from one, from this airport to another airport. Bricks and mortar aren't very good if you have to take it, take it down and move it. We had temperature control, temperature measuring devices on every shipment, about eight of them, so we knew what was going on during the flight. This is the kind of aircraft that we had for dispersal. They're uh, twin otter aircraft. They're larger than the one being used in Mexico. We could put up to 2,000 boxes on a plane, four or four and a half hour flight time. This is the crew loading, loading the uh, aircraft. This was the dispersal zones, areas, if you will, with the numbers of sterile flies per week, which were distributed over this area. Used the standard trap to catch adults, either wild or the wild ones, as well as the, uh, as the sterile ones. Public relations was an active undertaking, it was done very, very well ahead of our Public Relations Unit was the chief veter veterinarian at the Tripoli Zoo, a very eager young man, did a very excellent job. Was one of the ladies in the laboratory doing the dissections to determine whether the trapped females were sterile or, or native, or as well as to determine the, whether the larvae from the wounds were screwworm or some other species of, of fly. Quality control, of course, was a concern. It always is in this type of program. We duplicated in, in Tripoli the quality control tests that were done in Tuxla Gutierrez and had a continuous comparison between them. Uh, remarkably, as it may seem, in a number of cases, our flies showed better results than the ones in Mexico. I don't believe that the trip did them all that good, but. Anyway, we did not have trouble with quality. We did not have trouble with delivery time. This is the uh, monthly case record from the time they started taking records in uh, July of 1989 to July of 1991. The last case that we had was in April of 1991. There's been none since. These data it has to be taken with a grain of salt because all during this time improvements were being made in surveillance. The area was expanded, so it, it's an indication is all, is, is about all you can say. We put out 1.3 billion sterile flies, 800,000 of these boxes. <clears throat> Our aircraft flew 532,000 kilometers. nearly 2,000 hours of flying time, 41 million animal inspections. We trapped about 280,000 screw worm. Nearly all of these, I might add, were sterile. The females that were dissected, about 150,000. Wounds treated, something over 100,000. I think that seems to be the last of the slides. Now, the, the program went very well. It went very well for a number of reasons. It was well planned. However, the major, the major reason that the program went was that politics was not a part of it. The Libyan government supported this program enormously. Their investment was $40 million. The staff we were given was good. It was excellent. They were paid a bonus to work, and they did work. As an example, the, most of you have had some dealings with the military. And like all countries, there are military operations in Libya. And some of these military operations were taking place in the areas where we had to dump sterile flies. It took one telephone call by my co-director, <clears throat> and we got a window to disperse sterile flies when and where we needed. There was only one occasion 
and when we could not release when and where we needed it. The Libyan government made a political decision early in this program that we will eradicate. Let me give you a, let us turn this around. Suppose that the governor of the state of Iowa had to approve bringing in to Iowa screw worms from Libya. That's, they had to make a decision to accept Mexicans, Mexican reared flies, Americans, Americans very well running with the show, but they did it. To put the shoe on the other foot, and I think you will see the enormous contribution that the government of Libya made to this program. It, uh, it, it was very, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a member of the Chamber of Commerce, don't get me wrong. The, the, the government is, is bad news, but they did support this program. And they did uh, permit what had to be done, done. Now, in conclusion, the impact of the sterile insect technique in, on uh, entomology, mass rearing, rearing and mass rearing. I was involved in, in bow weevil work. I mean, part of it involved the looking at the sterile insect technique, we barely knew how to rear the thing. It fostered, the concept of the sterile insect technique fostered mass rearing of insects very, very much. I had a young man from Uganda in my office in Vienna about three weeks ago wanting to know where he could find out information on how to rear locusts. He wanted to look into the possibility of mass rearing locusts as a food source because they're considered a delicacy in Uganda, but they're only available a month out of the year. And he figures if he can rear them, he can sell them. Uh, population ecology is, is uh, been fostered by the concept of the SIT or area-wide control. Genetics certainly has. The insect genetics <clears throat> was not, it was of interest. But until a technology like this came along, population genetics was something that, uh, you know, you, you read about in a specialized journal that had no practical application whatsoever. The benefits of eradication could hardly be conceived. And as I showed you in the, one of the other, the other uh, <clears throat> overheads, it economically, it's enormous in the, in the cases where it's been done. Well, they've also eradicated cowboys pretty much in Texas because they, their prime job was not shooting people and herding cattle, it was treating, looking for and treating screwworm infested animals. That was their major job. That's basically what they were hired for. You never see it on TV though. And of course, <clears throat> the other thing that's uh, not, not uh, not, not all that frequently recognized is the environment, which is rightfully so popular these days, because we probably only get one chance. What did these two gentlemen leave us? <clears throat> what have they given us? These, I, I sat a long time and tried to figure out what, what to put down, and I really couldn't come up with anything very good except certainly ideas. I mean, Bushland spots ideas like, like a maniac. If you've ever been in a conversation with him, it's just a continuous flow, continuous flow. Nip, on the other hand, sits down with his napkin at the dinner table and, and, and draws graphs or does uh, simple population estimates, estimations and convinces you over uh, supper that his idea is absolutely correct and there's no other. And anybody's a fool to argue with him. <laughs> now, so ideas. They've given us many, many ideas. Observations. I mentioned earlier that they both made observations. But, and they put the observations together. 
the, the science of observing is, is, I think, not used very much these days. The naturalists used to sit around and observe. I think probably too much now we sit and look at computer screens or through uh, electron microscope pictures and this type of thing. It might not hurt us to be a little bit more observant <coughs> of nature. Persistence. Been mentioned that uh, their ideas had to be had to wait. I'm sure that there <clears throat> many many times that they would have much rather gone fishing than to continue to fight those people who were opposed to their ideas, who didn't want their ideas implemented, but yet they were persistent. They kept fighting. I think we can all learn from from that. And of course, they provided leadership. Scientific leadership, the leadership of science and of scientists. I am, have been privileged, very privileged, to have been associated with these two people. Thank you. keynote address, and it was just fascinating to see how the ideas originated from Dr. Nippling and Bushland have been applied uh, to the project under Don's leadership. You set the stage for the rest of our symposium uh, very nicely. Before we take our coffee break, we're going to ask our two laureates just to make a few remarks. And they asked me uh, before the uh, activities this morning on, on what they should say, and I said, whatever they feel like. So, so uh, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Nippling to come forward first for a few responses, then, then Dr. Bush. Dr. Nippling. See, they're, they're about to wear me out in the last three, four days. <laughs> I would like to repeat uh, a few, few of the things I said yesterday. One, there is no question that this world food drive is the greatest honor any agricultural scientist could hope to achieve. Now, Dr. Bushman and I were received this honor <clears throat> for our contribution to an idea that resulted in the elimination of the screw worm from uh, U.S., Mexico, and then recently Libya. But I did want to reemphasize that the success of this program was due to the contributions of many other scientists, livestock producers, and the people who led and and directed the operations. While the, the stir insect technique is probably considered uh, the, uh, the reason, the main reason, for the success of the screw worm program, there was another ingredient equally as important. And that's one of the things I want to talk about. The technique, the technology we had was applied in an organized, thorough, organized manner and against the total population 
in areas large enough to largely eliminate the factor of insect movement. This, in my opinion, is one of the, the most uh, significant uh, contributions of the screwworm eradication program. It demonstrated that if we will apply the technology we have or can have, uh, we, can, we can accomplish this for many other insects. In fact, I have expressed the view on several occasions that there are a dozen or more of our major insect pests that could be rigidly regulated. Populations could be rigidly regulated. Uh, if we would decide, if we would apply the technology we have or could have in a similar manner. I didn't mention specifically the insects I had in mind yesterday, but uh, I want to mention some of them because there are some of our more noted insects. One would be the boeing. Another would be the pink bollworm in the, in the western part of the United States. The cotton moth, the western part of the United States, Canada, and so forth. Also, uh, the sugarcane borer, one of the world's most important insect pests. And uh, I want to include the European corn borer, one of your major insect pests in, uh, in Iowa and in the uh, uh, Midwestern region. Even, I would include even uh, the, uh, our two, uh, mo our most important insect complex, uh, and that's the Heliothus species, the corn earworm and the uh, tobacco budworm. There are no fundamental reasons, absolutely no fundamental reasons, why we cannot put together the technology we have or can have and I'll say this to the corn borer or heliothers or a number of others. If we will only apply the technology we have and use it in the proper manner, and it will pay off, the, the cost may seem staggering uh, to the average person. If you thought about trying to regulate populations of the European corn borer, it might cost you. Uh, $200 million per year in the state of Iowa alone. Well, people, of course, react uh, uh, negatively to this, these large numbers. But from the information that, that I have obtained from your authorities here, the European corn borer probably cost the, the farm corn growers in Iowa, Iowa $500 million a year. My concept in managing some of these uh, insect populations is that we will have to do it in two phases. The first phase will be to reduce the population by whatever technology we have, and that will vary with the insect. And once we reduce the population, then we will keep it down, or in some cases eliminate it, but keep it down by uh, rearing and releasing uh, sterile moths, for example, or rearing and releasing key parasite species, or a combination of the other. Yeah, they, technically, theoretically, there are absolutely no reason why this would not work. And once you get the population down with these new techniques, the lower the population, the more efficient these techniques become. And we can also use these techniques without any disturbance to the environment. Thank you very much.
yesterday, Dr. Nippling challenged the audience, and if you read the Des Moines Register this morning, uh, they have that challenge on the front page. So your message is getting across to islands. And I hope that we have the, the people here in the audience today that will give your challenge much consideration and implement your suggested techniques. Next, we're going to have Dr. Bushman make a few remarks. To his friends, he goes by Bush, but he says during this political campaign, he uses that nickname just a little less than he used <laughs> Dr. Bushman. Yesterday, I thank Mr. Rua, Norman Borlaug, and all those associates that gave us this great, great honor. But today, I'm going to tell you, I, I feel a special kind of honor. I graduated from Brookings, just two miles north of here, and got my bachelor's degree in etymology. Uh, after my freshman year, my dad was broke. I had to earn every damn penny uh, for the last three years of college. And you know, then I thought South Dakota State College was great. I mean, I was a loyal student. But as I studied and especially got on to advanced courses in etymology, junior and senior year, I realized that down there in Ames, the best damn agricultural college in the whole U.S. was located. And it was my ambition to get to go to Ames for a graduate degree. Well, The problem was this during the Depression. I graduated from college in 1932. And there were dozens and dozens and dozens of would-be elemologists graduated in 1932. And they all wanted to go to Ames. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't make the cut. Uh, I had to go to Kansas State instead. <laughs> this is a good school. <laughs> uh, but now I'm legitimately on the campus, right here. And it's another honor. I feel, feel really happy about this. And any of you graduate students that are in this audience, you're just damn lucky and you better take advantage of the association. <laughs> now, Don Lindquist has covered technical aspects. And NIP has covered the need for the future for really using science and population control. All I want to talk about, and very, very briefly, is what a wonderful asset to America we have in smart farmers and good agricultural colleges. Uh, to mention and I learned this on the job down in Texas. Uh, all of our work, Nip and, and Don Lindquist's father and I, started dreaming about eradicating screwworms from Florida. That was a new population. They got introduced there in 1933. Before that, there wasn't a screwworm population east of the Mississippi River. But they raised hell and did $20 million of damage a year to the livestock industry. And the whole goal that Nick proposed initially with me watching the mating behavior of caged flies out in Menard, Texas, was an art linguist, Don's father, was right in with us in this whole uh, Gosh, if we could take and make advantage of this monogamous mating behavior, we lose it, that doesn't let me uh, We could eradicate the southeastern population if we could only find out some way to sterilize these male flies that we could rear in such abundance and so cheap in the lab that we could outnumber the 
wild population, which could breed only in moons and living animals. So this was our goal. And our goal was finally atten attained in the late 1950s. Uh, with the eradication by dedicated, led by veterinarians of the Animal Disease Eradication Division. And the whole, the whole thing was speeded up because at the beginning of the program there was a plant under construction at Sebring, Florida, in an abandoned air base. And in Orlando, we had a research facility with a pilot plant for field tests. And that we turned that over to the veterinarians to train this new staff of veterinarians that they brought in from all over the country. And got the coldest winter on record in Florida, that thing. And it killed out screwworms, ordinarily screwworms, thrive all winter long wherever it's warm enough for oranges and grapefruit to grow. But this time it killed screwworms clear down south of Orlando, Florida. And the veterinarian leader of the animal disease program proposed let's take advantage of that entomology pilot plant that can produce two million flies a week. And since this population's had a knockback that it hasn't had before. What we did, very enthusiastically, and built up the production of that plant from 2 million in December to 14 million by June when the state of Florida opened up a 50 million capacity uh, plant. Those two million gradually increased to 14 million. Weren't enough to treat the overwintering area south of Orlando, so we thought the best use we could make of them was to cover North Florida, the area north of Orlando, and mostly north of Ocala, between Ocala and Gainesville, where the University of Florida is, uh, as a barrier, just an experimental barrier. But as these flies from south of Orlando, Orlando would migrate north, that they'd come through that barrier zone. Maybe they'd be overwhelmed by these sterile flies we were putting out there and not make their usual spring migration into the southeastern states. Well, it seemed to work. That year, the screwworms didn't get into Georgia and Alabama as they always had before raise hell with the livestock industry. Uh, then that 50 million plant went into production and dedicated hard working people. That's one thing I got to bring up. Nip and I have got all kinds of fame out of this, but we've got it mostly because of the great accomplishments of hard working people, entomologists, veterinarians, uh, Cowboys, even technicians. Since we retired, but that publicity from Libya and the international stuff that Don Lindquist did uh, has helped us get recognition now. And I'm just a little bit embarrassed by it. But anyway, uh, <laughs> when, uh, our goal was accomplished the Florida eradication. But it made us think there was a barrier that seemed to work. And Dr. Nippling, he was the big boss. And the next guy above me was Art Lindquist, Don's father. And they gave me permission to go back to Texas and talk about the hope for a barrier zone for sterile flies. <laughs> the overwintering area in the citrus growing area of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley that's just about the same size as the overwintering area in Florida. And if we could t produce 50 or 100 million sterile flies a week and treat the Rio Grande Valley in the wintertime, when cold weather had a little bit north of there, then we could maybe spread those flies out in a 100-mile-wide barrier 
from the Gulf of Mexico to the deserts of New Mexico and uh, confine screwworms to Mexico and protect the United States. Well, it, it was a good hope. Eventually, now, this thing worked with modifications, learning on the job and smart, dedicated people that wouldn't give up doing the work. Uh, but the reason it worked was because of smart livestock producers, dedicated, hard-headed businessmen, and agricultural land-grant colleges that trained county agents, vocational ag teachers, trained most of the livestock producers. And if they weren't trained at an A&M college in Texas or Oklahoma from here, they had a vocational ag teacher who taught them in high school. And so there we had an educated producer population that was dedicated to the Trouble was the legislature in Florida had been nom dominated by city guys and uh, they couldn't get a state appropriation through. And we've got an endemic past that lives in the United States. Snip's looking at his watch, so I gotta shorten this thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, the law says uh, that the affected state has to pay half the cost of getting rid of its pests. And then the federal government takes care of the other half. And they couldn't, they, they, they couldn't get a law through the state legislature. So what they do, it was just a great big dream and a hope and experiment, but I had permission to talk to them, and boy, I so, I believed it. And when I saw how smart those producers were and how enthusiastic they were, they made me even more convinced this thing would work. And uh, they couldn't get the money out of the legislature, so they organized what was called the Southwest Animal Health Research Foundation. The only health they were concerned about was uh, myasis. Screwworms, not eating up their livestock. Uh, but it made a nice title, and it's called Swarf, and it's well known now all over. Those guys assessed themselves 50 cents for every cow and horse, and 10 cents for each pig, sheep, and goat, and raised over $3 million to get the, the pro Southwestern appropriation they couldn't get out of state legislators. And then they went to politics. Lyndon Johnson, who had kind of controlled Congress, was only recently vice president of the United States. And he put the heat on Washington. And they got a federal appropriation in 1962. And they eradicated screwworms from the Southwest. But the reason that they eradicated them was smart farmers who could understand the things that conservative agricultural administrators, I'm not talking about NIP, I'm talking about his bosses, the people above him, the, the, in Washington, they wouldn't do without proof and surety that it would work. But these farmers, hell, they gamble every time they plant a crop, and uh, they like the odds. In Florida, it costs $7 million to stop $20 million a year worth of damage. It paid off three to one the first year, and the rest was gravy. And this Texas and Southwestern situation was even uh, more rewarding if it was riskier to take, but the payoff was even bigger. And they took it, and it paid off. And because of that, uh, and the develops that followed, Screwworms were eradicated from Mexico. Now they're being eradicated from Central America. The goal is to have them out of there and a sterile five plant and a barrier down in Panama. 
And because of the what they did and what that sterile fly plant that they've got on the border of Guatemala and Mexico, Don Lindquist had sterile flies that the United Nations could buy from the uh, Mexico-U.S. Commission to eradicate screwworms from Africa and protect humans, livestock, and especially that vital wildlife resource of Central Africa. Thank you all. deal with politicians too from your experience. Now we're going to take a 15 minute break and have some coffee and refreshments, so let's return here in 15 minutes. 11 o'clock.